Hello and welcome to the Mastermind Body and Spirit Show. I'm your host, Matt Belair. Today's guest is an Egyptologist, hieroglyphics expert, tour guide, and director. He is an expert and offers a wide spectrum of knowledge regarding the history, arts, literature, and culture of the ancient Egyptians. He was born in Memphis, Egypt, and studied ancient Egyptian, Coptic, Islamic, art, and history at Helwan University in Cairo. He has been working as a tour guide and a teacher of hieroglyphics since 2000. His comprehensive knowledge of ancient Egypt, along with his background in comparative religions and spiritual studies, has enabled him to fill lecture halls and conduct a variety of successful tours over the years. When he is not on tour, he frequently lectures on Egyptian mythology, its spiritual aspects in Egyptian art, and the ancient Egyptian concepts of gods and goddesses. Welcome to the show, Mohammed Abraham. Hello, Matt. Hey, Mohammed, it's good to see you again. Hi. Uh, hello, my friend. It's always good to see my friends. We spent a great week uh, last year, so it will be great to uh, have you again. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't believe it's, it's taken me this long to get you on the show. I should have done it right away, but uh, it's cool because the Resonant Science Foundation, when we met last year in the academy mm -hmm. with Nassim Haramine and everybody went to Egypt, uh, you were one of the guides and uh, all of you guys mm -hmm. were amazing. And mm -hmm. uh, I think you blew most of our minds. It was really an incredible experience. So um, I'm really excited to share your work because um, you're right into the one of the deepest mysteries on the planet and so um really good to see you uh really good to see your friendly face it was such an amazing experience in egypt um do you want to give people a little bit of background about who you are um and and how you got into this and, and what you're doing today and then we'll dive into uh some of your research okay for sure uh you mentioned i was born in memphis and of course we're talking about memphis egypt not memphis tennessee okay <laughs> Memphis is uh, the ancient capital of, uh, of Egypt. We can say the uh, Memphis is almost uh, 6,000 years old. And uh, when we say Memphis, we shall include so many sites surrounding Memphis, like Saqqara, Dahshur, Abu Sir. Okay, so this is my playground area. When I was going like 10 meters right, 10 meters left, I see a pyramid in this side, I see a tomb in that side, I see a temple in the background, okay? So uh, I went to the primary school, like most of the kids. When I was in the fourth grade, they took me in a school trip to Saqqara, which was considered as a very close place to our hometown. Uh, I started to, of course I was aware with the history because I can see from uh, the balcony, from uh, the window, even from the kitchen window, I can see the pyramids, I can see the tombs. I was aware with this, but I wasn't aware about the, um, the visitors and that there are so many people interested in this field, interested in, in such things I keep saying every day and maybe I didn't pay attention to such uh, structures. So I started to say, what is happening? Why those people are here? So I started to start talking and communicating with them. I couldn't because of the language. We didn't study uh, English before high school in my generation. Nowadays, they study from a very early beginning. So my teacher told me, no, you can't talk with them unless you speak English. And if you want to join them, like this Egyptian guy, and he pointed at somebody is taking them around. He said, this is the tour guide and you need to be like him. To order, uh, in order to do something like this. So from that moment, when I was almost 10 years old, I decided to become a tour guide. And even after I get high marks in high school and I could go to uh, one of the uh, top class uh, colleges, I decided to go to tourism school to uh, study tourism and history together. Because we have separate college for history you can be graduated as Egyptologist, but pure Egyptologist. When I say Egyptologist, the difference between my study and the Egyptologist that he studied ancient Egypt only. But if you remember my, my uh, Payu, I studied ancient Egypt. 
I studied Coptic Egypt, I studied Greek Egypt, I studied Roman Egypt, I studied Islamic Egypt. All these uh, circles, or if I can call it the layers of Egypt from the ancient times till the modern times. And this maybe give me a great chance to start um, comparing between evidences because I'm not seeing one layer only, I'm seeing all the layers. And I made the, the, the way around, the opposite. People start with the ancient Egyptian layer and then they start adding above. Okay, so after I, I saw this technique, I said, okay, why the, we cannot say that the ancient Egyptian layer could be one in the middle, not necessarily the beginning. It could be second, third, fourth, maybe. So I start going deeper and search for more evidences and stories. And I found so many saying at least there is one layer before what we can call it now the dynasties. So we have different terms now, different uh, vocabulary. We don't say the Egyptian civilization or the ancient Egyptian civilization only. We shall say the dynasties time, which we uh, all know about King Tutankhamun, Ramses, uh, Hatshepsut, Kikofu. Those are the dynasties. But there are older layers, more advanced. And why say more, more advanced? Because we have seen so many objects were made with high technology, but were made during the time of primitive uh, rulers or primitive dynasties, like the first and the second dynasties. When we go to the Egyptian museum, we will find great art, very fine, delicate art. So how come they claim that those primitive people, and by Egyptologists, they admit those primitive people who made this. And those primitive people didn't invent the pottery wheel yet. So how can they deal with onyx, they deal with ivory, they deal with gold, they deal with amethyst, granite, and when you look to the objects, you find great details cannot be done without sophisticated tools run by machines. So it's not only a tool uh, run by hand. No, it needs to be run by a computer program like 3D printing. Okay. I didn't see such things in the beginning, but as I told you, when I start looking deeper and putting the idea in my mind, why we... Uh, and why we stop at that layer that the ancient Egyptian dynasties are the beginning. Let's go deeper. So I started to realize more and more. And every time I go to any site, I see more things. So I can tell you honestly, my visit to any site now, which could be like number 500 maybe or 600, it is the same like my first time. Every time I go, I feel it is the first time not the 600 or the 500 times. That's amazing. I really appreciate the, the background story. Well, all I can offer is when I went there, you know, there's one thing to see it um, in a picture and it's one thing to be inside it, uh, the, the Great Pyramids and all the other sites. And I didn't even realize, well, so much. <laughs> My ignorance is really next level when it comes to that stuff mm -hmm. and probably a lot of other stuff. But mm -hmm. um, I like how you, you kind of shared at the beginning that like you've been researching this your whole life. Like it's, it's never ending. It's still a mystery. You've discovered a lot. Um, you're comparing a lot of notes and you're also communicating with experts around the world who literally come to your home and discuss their findings and you get to kind of, you know, shop talk with them. So I think all of that's incredible. Exactly. Like, uh, as we said in October, I met Nassim Haramin and so many people in, in, the, in this group. And I met uh, Robert Grant, and this man is amazing. And I met him again like four months ago. I didn't pay attention to his lecture uh, at last October, but when we started to talk the second time about the numbers, and I found that there are great matching with the uh, Egyptian civilization. So we may do something together in the near future. And also I met so many people in other tours, like I met uh, Christopher Dunn, the uh, American uh, uh, English engineer, and he is one of the brilliant people. Talks about the uh, lost technologies of ancient Egypt from a great perspective, and I met Robert Schock, the American geologist, who also 
put uh, great uh, ideas and uh, with evidences how we can date the pyramids, the Sphinx, according to geology. No more stories written on papyrus without uh, uh, solid evidence or just uh, talks uh, or uh, stories written in the Greek books also without evidence. But now we are using science to prove what we cannot uh, find in books. Okay. Uh, so as you say, yes, I had great opportunity meeting such personalities. Uh, I can tell you, honestly, I, I had so many ideas like this before, but to meet someone can prove what you are talking about with uh, a scientific evidence, then you, you feel it's something uh, like uh, a great gift. Okay. Because for many years I was talking to people, I feel this, I feel that, but now I say it is proven by science. It is proven by this professor or by this engineer that this tool, that this stone have so many uh, deep stories than what we can read in the Egyptology books. Right, yeah. And is there a distinction um, between Egyptology and Chemetology? Because, you know, Robert Schock's works, that's one of the things I'm familiar. They, you know, he dated uh, the pyramids and the Sphinx to 10 to 12,000 years. And before that, they were saying a couple thousand or something like that. Like, wasn't even close. Very different. Look, let me fix this because unfortunately, people don't get uh, his opinion right. In the beginning, he said the very, very old age for the Sphinx and the, the pyramid. And we may can talk about 80,000 BC. Okay, 80,000. Oh. Yes, you heard oh. it right. Yeah, it's way off. <laughs> yeah, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the, um, how I can call them, the Egyptologist groups, especially in the United States, uh, were debating and arguing about this too much. Okay, so from a prospective point of view, he said, okay, the, uh, and, and this is the, uh, the opinion of Dr. Robert Schock, that the uh, conditions and the, uh, how do you call it, the erosion marks above the Sphinx body happened during the rainy season, which is almost nine or 10,000 BC. So what is the point that the Sphinx was there during that time? But how old is the Sphinx? We don't know. It could be one year before the rainy season could be 1,000 years before the rainy season could be 100,000 years. But so he said it was there 10,000 BC. But it's not necessarily to be to be 10,000 or 12,000 years old. It could be way older than the, the time of the rainy season. Ah, uh, got it. Thank you. Okay. Well, yeah, right. well, I, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you have a presentation, so maybe we, we'll go mm -hmm. into that because. You have a lot of information to share, and then I can just watch it, and if I get curious, ask a question. Okay. Uh, the story I'm going to talk about is the story of creation. And uh, we will see how the ancient Egyptians uh, were thinking about how not themselves were created, but how the universe, the whole universe was created, which is providing for us a, a very deep, philosophical uh, point of view that th those people were not just looking to the sky, looking to uh, shiny uh, objects or like uh, the, the stars. No, they were aware with what, what does it mean star, what does it mean uh, galaxy, what does it mean uh, uh, atmosphere. Okay, so our lecture today or our presentation is going to be about the uh, ancient Egyptian story of the creation. Let's start. It sounds amazing. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Okay, this is my logo, Guide of Egypt. Because I, I designed this logo to look like two pyramids, the one on the right side like step pyramid, the one on the left side like the true pyramid. So when we say Egypt, actually Egypt has many names, uh, ancient names and modern names. Kemet is the ancient name. And uh, to explain why I didn't write the vowels, 
like I pronounce the vowels, kemet, e, k e m e t, because we are not very sure about the vowels when we read the Egyptian uh, language. We are very sure about the consonant. So k, I'm sure it is k m t, but could be kemet, or komet, or kimat. This is what we are not very sure about. Okay, so we use our sense, and we normally uh, try to go to letter E better than A or O. So Kemet, this is the, the ancient Egyptian name, which means the black land. But not necessarily black because of the black color. It is because of the soil. The, uh, the mud used to come with the Nile every year with the flood. You know that the Nile is running through nine African countries. It's a very long river. If we say uh, the Nile without the branches and the Amazon without the branches, the Nile is the longest river in the world. But if we include the branches, it will be Amazon the longest. Okay, And also uh, for people to have better idea about how uh, or the significance of the Nile, it is the only major river in the whole world runs from south to north. No other river is doing this. Okay. So imagine the Nile is carrying the silt, the soil, from the African countries, uh, volcanoes in Ethiopia, in Kenya, and it all comes to Egypt with great uh, minerals. Uh, some of the minerals are uh, like absolutely uh, rare, like iridium. It helps the brain power. So the Egyptian realized this kind of uh, annual uh, magic and they called their land according to this great source of health of power of uh, Fruits of course and vegetables. So they call it Kemet and Now in foreign language it is called Egypt and by the way in, in Arabic language we have another name called Misr M-I-S-R or M-E-S-R So this is one of my uh, stories that Egypt has multi uh, names, has multi faces. When you visit Egypt, you will find that we are not one typical race. We are so many, even Asian faces. That's why I use or I, I love this story that Egypt is the source. Egypt could be a true, real mother to the whole world. And all the, uh, the nations once we're together in Egypt. Could be bigger Egypt or the same Egypt, I'm not very sure, but for sure that uh, all the humans, in my opinion, were once Egyptians. Uh, this is the problem, or this is the excuse Egyptologists wanted or made their, if I can call it game, against the Egyptian history. Netter, which means God. This is the word changed everything and stopped people from thinking uh, a scientific way. It became a religious way. And when we talk religion, you will find so many people with, so many people against, and we will have the priest controlling everything. And if you uh, say no, it means you are against the religion. So this is how they put the, the walls uh, or the, uh, the fence surrounding the Egyptian signs, and they call it Egyptology. This is how they convince you that the word netter means God, because there is an old man with a long beard next to this uh, shape, but we explain that the word netter, which changed it to Greek language, to natura, became in English nature. So netter is force of nature. So the wind is Nitter. The sun is nitter. Water is nitter. Uh, fire is nitter. Uh, any natural element is nitter. But it's not God. There is how the ancient Egyptians were thinking about the, the first time. Like, what was the first time? They were talking about Adam and Eve? No, they were talking beyond this they were talking about the first time of the whole universe 
they were not looking for answers how they were created but they were looking for answers how the whole universe was created so this is the word seb tibi and some people they say zeb tibi with z seb tibi means the first time or in another word the creation or the beginning hey muhammad okay can you explain um, where, like, the, see how it's numbered and there's letters? Like, can you explain that a little bit? Okay, so, the, uh, of course, we can see the symbol, like um, this symbol. Okay, this is S. Okay, but to make sure that I'm not confused and if anyone can read hieroglyphics, he will get the, the, the information easily. There is a code for every symbol. This is what we made as researchers. We put a code for every symbol. So with this code, I can be very sure that he is talking about S, not about any other shape. Because sometimes you can see a goose and a duck. You cannot know the difference from a distance, okay? So if I send you the goose, I will put the number, the code of the goose. So you will be sure that this is, is my uh, uh, intention. Uh, so the number here means the code. And it is a unique code for each symbol. And we all have the same coding way. So if I study in Egypt or in uh, Brazil or in any place, we all have that kind of code. It is one, how do you call it, like uh, the same code for all of us as hieroglyphic uh, students. Like a universal code. Universal code, exactly. So this would be, yeah, this would be um, really in-depth research for hieroglyphics, and that's how you're piecing the story together and then translating to uh, Egyptian? Exactly. Got but it. With the code, I can figure out the symbol. Okay? Yeah. So that's why I can, I can say I will not make mistakes. Got because it. now I have the right code. But if I depend on the symbol only, and uh, as an example, someone had uh, bad uh, drawings, he can draw something. I cannot be very sure what does he mean. Okay. So I could get, and, and one symbol can change the word, and one word can change the whole story. So that's one of the great ways. And that's why also I don't uh, underestimate Egyptology 100%. Okay, I pay great respect to Egyptology. We only um, debate about certain things, which is almost, or most of the cases will be about lost technologies. But I can honestly say that they did great job. This is part of what they did, about giving precise work, precise line, how we can reach the fact. Okay, but when we come to technology, we have great problem <laughs> with each other. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> Okay. So th the story of creation started with a um, great flood or great ocean, and the ancient Egyptian call it noon or none. Noon or none is before creation, before everything, before planets, before stars, before galaxies. And I couldn't get the right picture. This is not the right picture in my opinion because the right picture is supposed to be silent water, no movement. You, you can see this picture, there is kind of wavy uh, water. This is considered the second picture. After this silent ocean, a kind of waves, some movement happened. And from the bottom of this ocean, we had this island looks like a pyramid. And by the way, when you draw a pyramid in the future, you must add this rectangular base to it. The pyramid is not normal triangle. No, the pyramid must have this base under it. Okay. Uh, when this island came to the surface, we had this netter atom. Some people, uh, they say atom equivalent to Adam. I don't uh, disagree or agree much because here we are not talking about humans yet. We are talking about universal concept. Okay. So that's why, yes, uh, T in some cases can be replaced with D. So it can be Adam. But as I say, the point of view here is about cosmic, the cosmos, not about humans. 
So atom in the Egyptian language means perfect. So when the island was created, the circle of creation was perfect and it was the beginning of or the moment for all the elements to be created together. So this is what we call it the Heliopolis Inyad uh, story. Inyad means nine, and because we have atom, one, and then Shu, Tifnut will be three, and Nut and Geb, then five, and Set, Isis, Osiris, Neftis, nine. And ended was number 10. Number 10 was added later, but the original number is nine. 10 is to complete the story and to add zero to the story. And, and this is one of the evidences I use that the ancient Egyptian never uh, write zero. They started always with one, two, three, but they had 10, they had 20, they had 100, they had 1000. So they know that there are zero and not just one, lots of zeros. Okay, so who are those people? Let's start. So we met Atom. Atom is the first one, the complete one. And we may say Atom is all of them in one unit. Okay. From Atom, we had Shu, the one to the left, Air, and I can call him Oxygen. And we have Tefnut. Uh, humidity and it could be hydrogen so Shu and Tifnut according to the story get married okay and they had two more Geb earth Nut sky and here is the question people may not pay attention to this question how come we have a, a male a masculine as earth we always say mother earth but the ancient Egyptian could have different opinion. They had father earth, not mother earth. But I can tell you it is not uh, the same like we think. I think they were referring to certain energy of the, the planet. Not the whole planet is masculine, but they were referring to certain wave maybe or certain energy. So Gib is earth, not sky. And again, they, according to the story, they get married. The word get married here, in my opinion, of course, it means that they, they had interaction, they like chemical uh, experiment. So they had four children, two girls and two boys. The first two were born, Isis and Set in the middle, and then Neftis and Uzir. Uh, here is a very interesting story that uh, the Egyptians said that the days of the year are 360 days. I just uh, made that post yesterday in my uh, Facebook page, how many days in the Egyptian year. And actually people know the number, but they don't know how they reach this number. The Egyptians realized that there are 36 groups of stars. We call them the deacons. And they show up in the sky uh, for 10 days. Each star, the circles or the cycles of the stars are 10 days. No one, no star uh, spend more than 10 days in the sky. And then another star and then another star. That's why they said we have 360 days. What about the other five days? According to that story, Shu and Tifnut, when they get married, they ask the permission of Atom, and Atom said, okay. But when Geb and Nut get married, they didn't ask for the permission. So Atom was mad of them, and his, they, he told Nut, you are pregnant now, but the year is my year. You cannot have any, uh, you cannot have birth in any of my days. So what is the solution? She need one day to, to have the delivery. So Tos, or uh, yes, Tos or Betah, I'm not sure, I think Betah, he created five magical days at, and the, at the end of the year. So Nut had her delivery during those five magical days. So now we can understand how come the ancient Egyptian reached the number 365 days. But instead of 12 months, like we do now, the ancient Egyptian had 13 months. Because the last month is the five days. 
Osiris, or I, as I call him, this is the, the ancient Egyptian way to say his name is Osir. Osir. And Isis is Set. And Set and Nephthys. Uh, Osir married Set, and she gave him power. She gave him the throne. If you look above the head of uh, the knitter, she has a, a shape like a chair, or we call it the throne. And that's why the ancient Egyptian, when they put one golden rule, how the throne will move to the new king through the mother. So if your your father, if the king is not a, a good, uh, or it's not something very strong, your mother must be the queen. So if the king married the queen and then married another lady, commoner or even relative or a priestess, and had a boy from the second one, that boy has no right to become the king. The boy or the girl of the queen, from the queen. That's why I always say we can track the bloodline of the Egyptian females, the Egyptian queens, but not the kings. And isn't something strange when I tell you that to be a Jewish, your mother must be a Jewish because they took the same concept from Egypt. Okay, so the, the female bloodline is the, the source. So Uzir married Isis and Set married Nephthys. It seemed that Set, Set was not happy because Set later was considered at the god of evil. But I disagree about this. He wasn't uh, the devil or god of evil, but he was, we can call him as a troublemaker. He was the, the, um, the knitter of the desert, the knitter of the sandstorms. So the Egyptian, of course, didn't like this. Okay, So he was not so popular, but he wasn't bad. But he is just a different boy from the family. And, you know, he is not such polite or nice one. When he married Nephthys, if you look above her head, it's the shape of a gate. So as if he moved from this environment to another dimension maybe or another uh, environment that's why he wanted to marry isis to get the throne to get the bees but he didn't okay that's why he was angry with the family for a long time so when isis and ozir get married they delivered horus and horus here is a great creation it could be by the uh, original ancient or the older ancient Egyptian and could be by the modern uh, ancient Egyptians, the dynasties, to start what we can call it the masculine rule. From the time of Horus, they started to uh, squeeze the power of the feminine and they started to show everything in a masculine shape. Okay, I'm not saying that there was once a feminine uh, way I was saying I am saying that they were equality between both of them in ancient Egypt there was rules for our, our how do you call it um, certain uh, functions and uh, missions for the feminine and for the masculine but during Horus time everything became masculine Horus as we can see is a, a falcon originally a falcon and uh, the word Horus is Greek, is Hor without S. But any falcon is Horus? No. And, and this is one of the uh, things I brought here to explain to people that it is not about feeling, it's not about seeing, you need to study so you can give a good interpretation to the story. Anyone will see this without any studies, he will say this is another Horus. And yes, okay, but this is not Horus, this is Ra. This is the sun disk. It takes the shape like Horus, but he is not Horus at all. This is Ra or Ray, the as they call it the sun god or the netter sun. The ram is Kunum, a very important netter. When you are born, Kunum is creating a twin of you from mud or from clay, okay? We call it Ka. That's why you as a human, you are five things, okay? Let's count together the ancient Egyptian 
uh, point of view of humans that human is five things name someone has a name a body the name called ren ren r e n the body called get and then has a spirit or soul called uh, ba and then have ka which is not body not spirit in the middle level of body and spirit it is not 100 percent physical thing not 100 percent spiritual thing okay so we can call it the etheric body or the physical spirit i know it, it's not easy to understand but this is the truth about the ka okay and the ah what is the ah when the spirit leaves the body uh, during this time it goes up to the sky it continue as ba but when it goes very high outside the space it change uh, to a, a, a light very strong light called ah and ah means light and that is why we have akhinatun that's the name of our famous king akhinatun the light of atun Okay, so he was trying to express about himself that he is light. He is beyond the regular Egyptians or regular humans. Okay, so Kunum is the one who makes this strange creature called the Ka. Okay, we can consider the Ka sometimes as the consciousness, maybe as your awareness, uh, your uh, brain, maybe uh, your wisdom. Some people they call the Ka the ghost. That's why when we see in the movies someone dies, his ghost, it will be the car. We are not very sure, but we are sure that the car is something connected. It doesn't have a separate consciousness or it doesn't have separate uh, choice. No, it, it is connected with the body. Ah, here is Betah, a very, very important ancient Egyptian knitter. The word Betah, if we change P to F, which common like uh, we have like the word phone, we write it PH, okay? It's because of the ancient Egyptian language that P and it can change to F easily. So if we say Pitah is Fatah in Arabic language means the opener, the one who start everything, okay? And we can see he is holding all the ancient Egyptian main tools, the jade pillar, the Ankh, the Was Scepter. So he is the one who got all the powers. And he gave it later to the Nitters and from the Nitters to humans. Now we talk about very important uh, part of the story, the Egyptian civilization. When we say ancient Egypt, are we talking about dynastic Egypt? What is dynastic Egypt? It is the, the time from 3000 BC to 300 BC with all the names we know, Kofu, Kifrin, Tutankhamun. Hey, Mohammed, you froze on me. Come on, internet. Shoot. Hold on one sec. Hopefully he'll pop back in. I'll try to send him a note in the chat. Let me see. I'll try to hit him up on Facebook. Oh, oh shoot. All right, so it's just me live in the middle of a presentation. Shoot, um, I'm just gonna check Facebook. Um, he might just pop back into the link. He probably just got kicked out. So let me just send him a note. Hey buddy, internet went down. Can you just pop back in? All right, hold on everybody. Hopefully Muhammad will be back shortly. My mind is getting blown. All right, send me a message. 
I'll let you know. I'd have to just restart it. Waiting. Waiting. Ah, he says he's fixing the problem. So, all of you guys watching this, um, you know, I told him at the beginning to, you know, go through the presentation and just ask me or or tell me what we should talk about because when I was in Egypt with the Resonance Science Foundation, it's so deep that mystery and and the engineering and the technology and the history and the hieroglyphs and everything is so, so, so deep. So we're really lucky to have uh, someone like Muhammad sharing because he's been in it his whole life. He's looked at all of the different angles um, and he's open to new ideas and also bridging the science and then also the spirituality of all those stories. Um, so you have like mythology and things like that. So he bridges it very, very well if you haven't noticed so far. Um, and so hopefully this is going to be the first of many. So, um, he says he's coming back in and if he doesn't, uh, I might just restart it. Um, but we'll see, we'll see what happens. Otherwise I'm just sitting here talking to myself. So maybe in the meantime, if you're watching this, you can figure out a question you want to ask him. So put any questions for Muhammad in the comments. Um, we might get to them this time. I think he's going to just do his presentation. And we're going to do more. So I told him um, that I get people to put uh, questions in the comments and uh, we can look at those uh, after because I know that there's a lot of common questions as well. And so maybe we'll do a Q&A with him another time as well. So hopefully this is the first of many times we'll see him. Um, might just stop, come back in. Gonna be too much dead air. Okay, I'll stop this one and come back in. And stop. <laughs> 